So we have just under an hour to spend together, and my goals for this time are fairly simple. Um, so you've already heard, I hope, right, about the neurobiology, uh, Dr. Thompson this morning, about the neurobiology of shame, and maybe you had the pleasure of hearing breakout with Dr. P, so maybe you got a little theology today, that would be great too. Um, these are very worthy and important topics, and neither are my areas of expertise. So I'm telling you that up front, because if you came here expecting me to quote scripture at you, that's not gonna happen. Um, and I apologize for that. Um, it's not that I don't spend time in the word I do, but um, today I'm speaking from m my area of expertise, and I think it marries well with biblical truth, but I'm, I'm gonna hopefully share some things that are a little bit different than that. Um, my discipline is psychology, and even more specifically, clinical psychology from an individual and a family systems perspective. So this topic is right up my alley because <laughs> this is what I deal with all the time. Um, so um, I want to talk with you briefly about the origins of shame and that both within ourselves and within our families of origin. And I want to encourage you, right, by letting you know that what what my topic says here, right? That recognizing and giving voice to the ways that shame um, and our experiences of childhood and growing up have caused us hurt and pain and woundedness, that process can actually bring relief and healing and it does not require dishonoring our parents or disowning our families um, or blaming anyone in the process. So. Um, hopefully, uh, in the time we have together, I'll be able to help you understand that and we'll um, have a chance to talk about it. I, I am going to encourage you right now, start thinking about your questions, because I'm really only going to talk for about 25 minutes, and the rest of the time is for us to talk and have questions. So, um, Okay, so let's just set some foundation, right? So what are we recognizing, <laughs> right? If I'm saying it's about recognition. so. The bottom line is childhood shapes, late, shapes us, right? shapes our later life. This is true in every society and point in history. I mean, it crosses cultures. Um, you know, I, I, I talk about um, parents as co-creators, right? We are, we know, right, from scripture, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. God, you know, knits us together. Um, and then, when we come out of that womb, it's our families, right? Might be parents, might be grandparents, significant others, whoever. Those people in our, in our world co-create us. They, they speak into who we will be later in life. And that is a, that is a process, again, that crosses all kinds of um, boundaries in our world. Now, obviously, we have to understand that shaping from a cultural perspective, from an individual perspective, um, those contexts are very relevant, and we'll talk about that a little bit later too. But, so, the God of the universe, right, created us to start life and live life and grow within a family. He designed it that way. However, we all know, right, sin and corruption messed that up. <laughs> um, and uh, that destruction and brokenness to God's original design, now, even in the best of families, right, is present on some level. That brokenness, that injuredness, the result of sin, right? Um, whether that's current, like active sin, or just the result of, you know, the original sin, we're all broken. Humanity as a whole is broken. And so our families, unfortunately, on some level, are broken. So even in the best, most loving, Christ-honoring families, we have parents who are themselves emotionally injured and broken, and they're struggling with their own issues of shame and unworthiness. And those parents do their very best right, with good intentions, most of them. I'll come back to that. 
do their very best with, most, with good intentions to provide healthy, wonderful upbringing for their children, and they pour into them, and they try to make that happen. However, right, inevitably on some level, they are passing on their injuredness to their kids, right? Because they're not perfect, they're not completely put together, they've got their own stuff happening, and so even the best of intentions, with the best of intentions, they're gonna cause some of those uh, injured, all that injuredness and brokenness to be passed on. Um, uh, someone else who kind of talks to this, in her book, Alice Miller, I think I put her up there, um, talks about the need to understand how an infant or young child who is totally dependent on the adults in their world, right? An infant child is completely 100% dependent on those around it for its survival, much less its emotional comfort and all of those things. So that child can experience emotional suffering even when the parent is not malicious or intending harm, right? So many folks, parents, when they have children, uh, they tend to see kids as, an, as, an, as a part of and an extension of themselves, right? They want, they want to see you know, their legacy, so to speak. And that's a good thing, it's a good idea. But sometimes the way that translates is, if this, is, if this person is an extension of me, then it's hard to imagine that what brings me comfort, what works for me, what makes me feel good, wouldn't also work for my, this extension of me. But sometimes there isn't thought, right, to the fact that what brings me comfort and I'm good with may have a very different impact on this very different separate human being who is also my child, right? And so sometimes, I, even unknowingly, right, I'm intending good and I could be imposing or imparting something that doesn't feel right or that feels emotionally damaging. So again, it's not about blame. In most, I would say in most cases, now I'm gonna come back to the fact that there is reality, right? There are people in the world who intentionally cause harm to children and that is an awful thing and, and also a result of sin and brokenness. It's not really the nature of the topic we're talking about today, um, but it is also you know, part of what we're, what we're dealing with. But I'm saying even, again, good, well-intentioned, Christ-honoring people are still passing on their brokenness in some way, shape, or form. And we have to stop and recognize that because it really does have an impact for us. So, where does that go? So in some ways, I'm sure you've heard this before, right? Denial is adaptive, right? So, um, uh, some might even call this idealizing, right? So we do have a tendency to want to think positively. We want to see the best, right? So I, I actually call this resilient remembering, right? It's, it's resilient for us. It helps us lead a positive, happy life if we can remember what it is that we, uh, all the good times that we had in our family growing up. The fun times, the laughter, the, the things that our parents did and gave us, did for us and gave us, and the ways they poured into us. And we want, we want to remember all of that. We need to remember those times um, because it does build our resilience. It makes us um, feel healthy and happy. However, <laughs> sometimes, uh, whether it's due to cultural norms, because certainly there are cultures in which this is the way it is, or our religious upbringing, because I think sometimes our faith can help us sort of take this path, right? We, we tend to deny anything that isn't happy and wonderful, right? My childhood was great. Okay. We tend to deny anything <laughs> that was painful or that had a kind of a negative impact on us, right? For fear of blaming, right? Or not wanting to cause harm, and I get that. However, the, the, the inverse of that is that then we end up pointing that at ourselves, right? And then we blame and shame ourselves. I'm broken, something's wrong with me. Rather than recognizing that has an origin, it has a source, you didn't just dream that up all on your own. So, 
blaming and shaming ourselves for our current life issues and problems without taking a hard look at where does that connect to my family of origin is taking on a little too much responsibility, right? So overcoming that denial is a process of self-awareness and it takes a lot of courage, right? Because you have to actually be willing to kind of look at that stuff and frankly consider what are some ways that, that growing up in my family wasn't, wasn't awesome. So why does any of this matter? Um, somebody I love to quote because I think she's fabulous. Um, Brene Brown puts it this way, right? You better be able to tell the truth about who you are and where you come from because our sense of worthiness lives inside that story. And I think we can take and put that, frankly, in context with what Dr. Thompson talks about, about the biblical narrative, because our worthiness also, right, lives within that, the biblical narrative as well. But these things come together. So shame is the part of us, right, that's constantly whispering, you're not good enough. Or if you're lucky enough to actually adopt some sense of, I, I think I'm okay and I I'm doing okay, then, then the next accusation from shame is usually, who do you think you are, right? You're getting a big head, stop that. So, you know, it's always tearing us down, always telling us what's wrong, always trying to trip us up, right? And in her research, what Brene points out about the research about shame and vulnerability and all of that is all the negative side effects or things that are correlated with experiences of shame are pretty much a list of all of the mental health and interpersonal issues that you might find on a college campus. So for example, right? Fear, anxiety, depression, suicide, and self-injury. Mm -hmm. Eating disorders or other addictions. Because if shame is constantly talking at me like that, I think I'd rather be comfortably numb, right? and even violence, because sometimes we take that kind of vile self-hatred and we direct it outward because it's a little more comfortable than where it's being directed at us. Why does any of this matter, right? So again, Renee goes on to say, like, if we don't claim our worthiness inside our story, then we end up, I love this phrase, hustling for worthiness outside our story. Basically, we're looking for everybody else's approval, right? And I think some of you probably can relate to this. So she basically just suggests to ask yourself, ask yourself the question, um, what does your hustle look like, right? So when you are feeling shame, unworthiness, right, sort of blaming yourself for the origins of these things in your life, um, where, where are you hustling? Where are you looking for worth? Other researchers talk about characteristics of adults who experience emotional injury as children. Um, I just use this list because I think it's a good description of some possibilities of what your hustle might look like, right? So it might look like this. Image management or pretending. It looks good on the outside. However, inside is full of despair and disgust and self-loathing and you wonder why somebody might be depressed or suicidal or have self-injury or use self-injury to kind of manage that pain. Could be perfectionism or just unrealistic expectations. I don't see any of that on this campus. Please. <laughs> right? So you're, you're, you know, you got to get it right all the time. Never let them see you sweat. Right? You're doing a hundred things, going a hundred miles an hour, and you can handle it until you can't. And that crash and burn is not pretty. <laughs> um, maybe it's procrastination. If I never try, I, no one will see me screw it up. So I just don't do anything. Okay, that could, could get in the way. Um, this is often, I think, and this is something that uh, I see a lot, especially in what I would consider good, faithful Christian folks, right? And that's taking on the caretaking role, right? So I'm here to take care of everybody else and meet others' needs. Yes, biblical. <laughs> but to the sacrifice of myself, not biblical, 
right? Jesus took time out in the garden to pray and restore himself. We need to do the same thing, but sometimes we're so, our hustle, right? We're hustling to get that approval, and so it's all about everybody else and not about us. Or maybe we just wall ourselves off and we don't really engage with anybody. Because if they can't get in, they can't see how ugly it is in here. Sometimes it's like that. Or maybe it's appeasing or pleasing, right? So our way to connect is through um, affection, right? And, and, and making other people feel good. So these are just some suggestions, right? I'm asking you to consider for yourself, what's your hustle? How are you seeking worthiness if you're not able to own that within your own story? And I think probably most of us go through that process. Okay, so what do we do about this? What can we do about any of this? How are we doing on time? Okay, good. So, um, so I'm suggesting it's not about blame or accusation, but it is about recognizing. It's about pausing to own what has impacted us, right? And I, I realized in the last session that this list is a little bit of out of, out of order, so I'm going to go out of order. Because I think we need to start with acknowledging our injuredness, right? So we just have to accept the fact, like, we're all broken, you all know that. Um, but I think accepting our injuredness and, and frankly recognizing what are the connections to my family of origin? What were some of my experiences? Um, and just acknowledging how that has impacted me. And own our story. Like, like this is who I am, good, bad, and otherwise. These are the things that I'm grateful for and that were provided for me, and these are the things that were missing. And then there's a process involved, I think, in that, um, uh, which is kind of missing from my slides, so I'll just add it now. So, and that process, I think, looks like grieving. Right? We need to be able to acknowledge what's happened and own it. And some of doing that is about grieving what we lost. Right? If things didn't go just exactly as we expected growing up, then chances are good. There's sadness there. And sometimes we need to spend time. Um, I think I talked about um, cleaning out that well of sadness so we can fill it up with something more positive. So we have to deal with that grief, which then I think allows us to have some empathy and compassion, both for ourselves and for our parents or family or whoever it is who was significant in your world. Um, I think part, again, it's part of the healing process is as we are able to acknowledge what's happened, grieve the losses of those, and then and think about right, the brokenness that our families also carry from their past, then, then we can be empathic about that, right? We can, we can understand and offer compassion to ourselves, like, well, we're, we're sort of next in line for what's happened here, and also uh, our family are suffering from their own brokenness as well. And then, how do we do some of that process, grieving, talking about all of this, Obviously, it's in community, right? The whole theme of Tori, right, is being known, right? Being known by, completely known, right? Strengths and weaknesses and warts and all, and then feeling that acceptance and love. So we wanna access those communities where we feel acceptance and where we can have that experience. And then, of course, you knew, because I'm a therapist, I had to put that last one up there, right? <clears throat> that, you know, for some people, um, that process is well done in therapy. And so, you know, I mentioned obviously there are those who have had very, very extremely negative, harmful, abusive pasts with their families. And certainly they might value and benefit from therapy, but I'm going to suggest that everyone in this room could benefit from the process of self-examination, self-exploration, and understanding and grieving losses and having compassion and all the steps that I'm just talking about 
with the benefit of therapist. It doesn't have to happen in that setting. It could happen with your friends, with your classmates, with trusted advisors, spiritual folks, spiritual direction. There's a lot of ways this can happen. I'm just obviously kind of sold on therapy because that's what I do. All right. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.